If you have your Bibles, uh, please open up to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses um, 12 through 14, and then 19 through 26. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in the leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Verse 19. When evening came, they would go out of the city. And they were passing by in the morning. They saw a fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Whatever you whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither Neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you your transgressions. And may God add the blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to be looking at uh, uh, this passage today. We're looking at three specific points. His disciples were listening. Pray, ask, and believe. And pray and forgive. Have any, one of us, have any one of us ever learned a craft where we had to um, be a, an apprentice for someone, or we had to watch someone, or we had to observe someone, um, or we had to shadow someone in order to observe them to see what they were doing, to, obs to see what they would, um, see how they would do whatever uh, we were watching them to do? Well. Um, it, that's something that is, uh, I think, inherent with every apprentice. Every apprentice will learn and look and observe. Um, if you learn, want to learn a craft, you learn from the best. You want to learn, um, like a, um, a smith was someone that was, uh, he learned his craft. That's where the name Smith, the last name came from, was Smith because the person they would learn from the person. They became a smith of whatever they were doing. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture where the disciples learn of Jesus um, and they learn uh, and they observe what he does. And then they observe and then they see what he says and then they follow through and he talks about faith and he talks about believing in him and he talks about forgiveness and as we pray. So we're going to be looking at these things this morning. And let's just hear what the Lord has to say um, as we look at these uh, things. Now, again, this was the end of the, the end of the, the this is the last week of Jesus' life. Um, he was, um, he would go out of Jerusalem during the day and then he would go into Bethany at night. And at, at this point, Jesus had gone out of, um, he had gone out, and he was already out in Bethany, and which was uh, an area just outside of uh, Jerusalem, and then he was, they were on their way back in. And so, as they were, um, as Jesus was leaving, and his disciples were leaving Bethany, they were on their way back into Jerusalem for the day. So we'd leave Jerusalem at the, in, in the evening time, and come back during the day. And so while they're on their way back into Jerusalem, Jesus sees what? Sees a fig tree. Now fig trees were um, pretty common back then, and they were, the fruit was used uh, for, uh, was pretty common fruit for people. But it wasn't the season for fruit. But what did Jesus do? He says, seeing at a distance a fig tree, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. Now, Jesus knew 
Jesus knew that it wasn't a season for fix. It wasn't a season for fix. But when it came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season. And he said to may no one ever eat fruit from you again. His disciples were listening. So Jesus was using this as an opportunity to do what? To teach his disciples. And he was using an illustration, a real live illustration, in order to make a point that he was trying to uh, drive home for his disciples and for his people. And so he uses this fig tree. And even though it's the fig tree was not in season, Jesus sees it and Jesus curses it and says, may no one ever eat from you again. And so we see here that Jesus was using the situation for his disciples. And what were his disciples doing? This is really, 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 really important. His disciples were listening. Okay? His disciples were what? They were listening. Now, if you look at the passage that comes after this, in verses 15 through 19, what did Jesus do? Jesus went in and he did what? He turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple. Jesus was upset. Jesus was upset at this point. He was angry at, at upset about the situation in Israel at that time, in Palestine at that time. He was upset about what was going on. So what did he do? He cursed the tree. So we're going to see here what, how the connection of the tree connects with, our, connects with Israel and his people. Because it wasn't just a random curse saying, oh, well, you curse, you know, there's no fruit on there. I'm not going to curse you, so you may, you never, may nothing ever come from you. But there was a reason and a purpose why he did that. And as we're going to see, what was the, what was the state of Israel during this time? State of Palestine. What was the state of the people? Most of the people were not bearing fruit for God, were they? Most people weren't. In other words, people who were supposed to be bear, should be bearing fruit, they weren't bearing fruit for God. And so Jesus is making a point here that the religious leaders who should have been bearing fruit for God and should have been pointing towards God and following him as examples weren't doing that. So the state of it, Jesus was upset and the state of Israel at that point in the hearts of the people. So what does he do? He curses the tree and uses that as an example. Now the disciples were doing what? The disciples were listening. So they saw Jesus, they saw how he acted, they saw how he responded, and they listened to what he was saying. And they watched what he was doing. They watched and listened to it. They listened to and watched his words. Now that's an important aspect. Why would they be doing that? Why would Jesus be doing, why would he curse a tree? Why would he do something as, as just out of nowhere it shouldn't have been fruit on her anyway, so why would he curse that tree anyway? But his disciples were listening and they were paying attention. And I think it's really important for us to take note as well is that when Jesus is trying to speak to us or speak to his people, he will sometimes use unusual circumstances or unusual situations to make his point about what he wants to teach us. In this case, it was a fig tree. But in the case of us, what is it that he is trying to teach us that we need to learn from him that he wants us to listen to him? He wants us to observe him. He wants us to take note of him. And this is really important because sometimes we'll miss out on what Jesus is trying to say and what Jesus is trying to do. And this is really, really important. This is why we, myself, and all of us 
need to be in tune with what's going on when Jesus acts and when Jesus responds. Has Jesus ever done anything unusual in our lives? Where, where did that come from? Why did that happen? Well, why did that happen? Well, why was that going on? Well, why did this, you know, why was that? You know, it's like, but were we listening to what Jesus was saying? Were we observing what he was doing? Were we taking note of what was going on, even though we didn't understand, saying, okay, Jesus, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm listening. I'm taking note. I'm paying attention to what's going on in the circumstance and the situation, even though we don't understand it. You're still listening. Okay, Jesus, I'm, tr I'm trying to listen. And, that's, and I think that's the key, one of the key important things about us in our relationship with God. In our relation, in our walk with Him, and we want to be successful as 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 Christians and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Well, it, it's important that we listen and observe what Jesus is saying and what He is doing, even in the unusual circumstances and situations. Taking note of what's going on and paying attention, having your journal and writing it down. Or taking a mental note and, and, and storing that mental note and observing. Because if you don't, you're going to miss out on what Jesus may do, not only in that moment, but in the future days to come. Because some of those things are not only tied for the moment, excuse me, they're not only tied for the moment, but they're tied for the things that will come and the days that will come ahead. Does that make sense? Because... If we don't pay attention now, we're going to miss out not only now, but in the days to come also. And that's so important, folks. Listen, observe, take note of what Jesus is doing. Okay, let's go on to our, our, our second point. Pray, ask, and believe. When evening came, they would go out of the city. So they went back out of the city. So they, they came into the city. This is verse 19. We saw that Jesus already had turned over the tables. He was upset about that because the people weren't following him. And now they're, they're, um, they even came, they, they went back out of the city. So they came into the city. Jesus turned, overturned the tables. He's, he, he, had, he was upset with the way things were being handled in the temple, the way they were treating God's house. And, they were, and it, those were some pretty unusual circumstances. And we learned about that last week. But as well, um, he goes back out of the city, and they see, seeing the fig tree, and it was withered. Okay, so, backing up, they saw, what did Jesus do earlier in the day? They saw, Jesus had cursed the fig tree, didn't he? And it was a difficult day because of the temple. But they come back out, and now the fig tree is withered. What's that all about? What is all that? What's that all about? Why is the tree withered? Jesus cursed it, and now it's withered. Why, why would he even do that? Why, how did that even happen? But what they were looking at was a hand of Jesus. Jesus did something. Remember the observation, listening to what he's saying, and then observing the results later on. And what were the results? Jesus said what he's, what he's going to do, and it happened. So what can you learn from that? And so that's what Jesus was asking his disciples. Because Peter responds, and Peter responds properly. I and mean, this is something that we need to learn as well. And and, Peter, and, and as they were passing in the morning, he saw the fig tree. P, and, and, this, and this is significant too. Withered from the roots up. Not just the leaves fall off. Like in the fall, in the fall when we have trees, the leaves fall off. But this, it was withered. It was dead. It was completely gone. It was completely dead. And so what happened? The tree was completely gone. And it was there, but I mean the roots were all withered. And Peter and Peter reminded and being reminded. Okay, so remember, remember Peter was listening. Remember the disciples were listening. 
They were listening to what Jesus was saying. And Jesus said, and then they, they were listening. And then Peter was reminded, oh, okay. Okay. I remember that, that, that tree there. Didn't you curse that Jesus? He reminded, he saw the tree and said, oh, wow. He observed, he didn't miss it. He could have just missed it. In other words, had he not taken note, had he not listened when Jesus cursed the tree, he would have missed the moment then to say, Jesus said that, and now the tree's dead. What's that all about? See, because he acted and he, res they, he responded and took note in the past, he was able to, to observe and see the hand of God in the moment and see what God was doing. And so he asked God, well, what's going on here, God? And that's why, again, it's so important to be observant because you miss things in the, in the moment, in the past, and you don't learn from them, you're going to miss the things that are going to happen in the future. And you're going to walk completely right by, it's like this never even happened. And you'll miss what God is doing. So Peter asks him, and he says, um, and saying, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you have cursed has withered. So he noticed that Jesus cursed the tree and it's withered and it was done. So now here's the, now because he observed, now in the past, he's, He's asked the question now, and he observed in the moment because he made because he made the two connections, and now we can ask God, well, what's this all about? What's this all about? You see how Peter was observant, and now he got to experience God in the moment right now, and see what he was doing, and what God was doing was saying, and Jesus answered and said to him. Have faith in God. So Jesus uses it as a teaching opportunity to teach about something even greater and even deeper. You know what the problem was with the 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 um, the church, not the church, but the the um, you know what the problem was with the uh, the faith of the the people of Palestine and the and the followers of God and His people is that they, never, they always, they would believe God for a moment and then they wouldn't believe him. They would believe God for a moment and they wouldn't believe him. They wouldn't, they wouldn't listen. They didn't listen, they didn't observe and they missed out on what he was doing and they wouldn't believe what he was doing. So one of the things what he was upset was is that the people, the church, the faith, the people, those in Israel didn't have faith in him. They didn't believe him. They, God had done wonderful things. They missed that and still didn't believe. And over the centuries and over the years and over the, the times, um, they, and there they are from the beginning, from when God made the promise to Abraham, even from Adam, all the way to that point, there were those along the way that didn't believe God. And here they are, they've had all these things that God had done, and God, God had, and what, and what was the thing that they didn't do? They continued to question what God was doing, and they didn't continue to miss what God was doing, and they would not believe. And that's so important because if God does something supernatural, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be um, something if, okay, so he did it then, and he's doing something now, so why would it be hard to believe now? If he did it then, why not now? Right? Has God changed? Has God changed at all? So if God had done then, why can't he do it now? But that's where Israel was. They saw all the things that God had done, but yet they still hadn't believed. They still weren't believing. 
And that's what he was upset with them about, was their unbelief in him. But what was he encouraging Peter to do? What was he, have faith what? In God. You saw what I said. I said, I curse this tree. Now the tree is cursed. But you believe in me. Don't be as, have faith in God. Have faith in me. Have I done it before? Did I say something and did it not come to pass? Did I do something and will, will, did it not manifest itself and show itself? Did I not do that? Peter, you saw me curse the tree, right? Did it not come about? Did it not happen the way I said it would happen? Yes, it did. That's why you need to have faith in me. Because if I say I'm going to do something, I will do it. But you have to have faith in me. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Believing in what God has done and what God has said and what he's going to do. That's the thing. God, and that's... And folks, that is a matter of trust. That is a matter of trust in him. Is he a good God? He is a good God, right? And we've all experienced that. We've all experienced the goodness of God, as it was sung this morning. We have. He's done miracles in our lives. Every one of us, he's done miracles in our lives. And why can't he do it again, right? Why can't he? Is there any limitation to what God can do? No. I was just reading about this article, and I love talking about this, but this article about they found a new galaxy that was is probably the largest ever that they found. And I can't even begin to... Um, and it showed, showed a picture of it, and it looked... And it was, I, don't, I can't even do the mathematics on how large it is. And, I, and it just to go across, I don't know how many millions of light years it takes just to go across a one galaxy. Just one galaxy. And then the galaxy is sitting in, in the midst of this dark, in the midst of space, which is infinitely times larger. So I saw the picture of it, and they, they, I guess they take it from radio waves. I think that's how they do it. And to me, it was fascinating because God spoke that into existence, right? It wasn't a big bang. God spoke that into existence. And the reality of that, to me, is if that if God created that and spoke that, if you look at Genesis and he spoke that into existence, and he spoke creation into existence, all the intricacies and all the details of creation into existence with a word of his mouth, then why can't he do what he says he's going to do in our lives? Right? Why do we doubt? Right? Why do we doubt? If he did that, why can't he do it again? He does it all the time. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. We're here. We're, we're miracle. We're here, the breath of God. Our lives are a breath of God. He put in us the breath of life. We're a miracle. Psalm 139 talks about that. Right? I knew you while you were yet in your mother's womb. I formed you in your mother's womb. He formed us intricately. And medical science only knows about 20% of how the human body works. And yet God did all that and the intricacies of that. How much more can he do? Right? How much more can he do in our lives? With situations that look impossible, with situations that look beyond the capability of being resolved. 
or being mended or being healed. Can he do that? Absolutely he can. Absolutely. Can he provide for those who have need? Why do you worry about what you're going to eat or drink? Right? Does not your father know about those things? Your heavenly father know? Absolutely. Can he provide food for the, our daily bread? Like it says in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Can he provide that? Can he provide housing? Can he provide clothing? Can he provide jobs? Can he provide health? Can he provide mental health? Can he provide emotional health? Can he provide uh, victory over addictions? Can he provide victory over other um, things in our lives? Can he do it? Absolutely he can. And there's no reason. Can he heal and reconcile broken relationships? Absolutely. I know he can. Does he hear our prayer? Absolutely he does. But we have to believe him. What is he, what is he saying? Have Faith in who? In God. You hear TV. I hear this a lot, and it gets me upset. It says, you got to have faith in yourself. I have faith in me that I could do it. Like you are capable in and of yourself to be able to do something. Have faith in yourself. What does the Bible say? Man says have faith in yourself. The Bible says have faith in who? In God. Because it's God that gives us breath. It's God that creates. And it's God that um, takes life. He gives life and he takes it. Right? It's God, not ourselves. We have no power in and of ourselves. We have our intellect, our physical strength, our abilities, our skills. Everything that we have is not because I pulled myself up by my bootstrap. I worked hard. I did all that I could do. That's a lot of malarkey. Yeah, you probably worked hard, but the reality is, who gave you all those things? He did. Who gave you the intellect to be able to work? Who gave you the strong body to be able to, to, to work? Who gave you the ability to be able to study? Who gave you the ability to be able to do specific crafts and whatever gifts that you have, of music or, or, or speech or, or, or teaching or whatever it is? Who gave it to you? Who gave it to you? He did, not because you're anything great, not because you're anything that you have, but it all came from him, right? We cannot claim anything for ourselves because everything that we have, what does the scripture say in James? It says, every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father in the heavenly lights with whom there's no changing nor shifting of shadow. So everything we have, everything that we are, is because of what? Because of him not because of anything that we have done. We're stinking sinners. We're born into sin. But by God's grace, we are forgiven. And by God's grace, he's given us life. He's given us life more abundantly. Right? Only by his grace. Just like it says behind me. For by grace you are saved through faith. And this, not of yourselves, is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? All a gift from him. And the Lord gives, and he gives to us, and he gives abundantly, folks. He gives abundantly. Truly I say to you, whoever sets his mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes on what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. So you see that mountain there? It's probably referring to the mountains in, in that area. There's a lot of hills in, in Palestine and Israel then. You go into the sea, whether it be the Black Sea, Sea of Galilee, well, it's not Galilee, but Galilee's, wherever, whatever sea, but the point was that something impossible is that. Casting a mountain into the sea, and you say for it to be done, and it will be done. Because it would say, um, it will happen it will, ha it will be granted to him. What's the caveat here, though? There's two caveats. One, he doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen. It's not name it and claim it. I don't believe in that. I well, this is what I'm going to have this. I see that Ferrari right there. I'm going to name it, and it's going to be mine. That's not, I'm not talking about that. And naming and claiming is a lot of baloney. 
It is. But what God's talking about here is, is having faith in what God says, not what we want, not what our flesh wants, but what God wants for us, right? Not my will, but whose will? His will be done. So we're praying for his will in circumstances, not our will, not our purpose, not what we want, but what he wants for us, his will for us. And so that's what, and we can pray that and we can honestly say, God, I believe you for this. Is there anything too difficult for God? So what does he say? He does not doubt in his heart, saying, God, I don't know how this is all going to happen. I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't know how this is going to play out, God. But I, because it, it looks impossible, it really does look impossible, and it doesn't look like there's going to be any answer or any situation uh, how this is going to be resolved, God. I don't know, and it's really hard, God. It's really hard, God. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Don't we face circumstances and situations where it's really hard to believe, right? Where it's really hard to believe in this circumstance, in this situation, and these things, right? Right? It does. Did he do it before? Have we observed God before? Remember taking those notes? Remember I talked about that? Listening to what he's doing? And seeing what he's doing? Did we take notes? Did we observe what he did? Does that give us the strength to help believe? Right? He saved a stinking sinner like me. I'm talking about myself. And all the mess that I was in. And all the things that I've gone through. And yet, that's a miracle things I came out of, and the circumstances I came out of, and the things that I've done, which I'm not proud of. God showed me mercy, he forgave me, he saved me, he's sanctifying me, and he's continuing to sanctify me. All a miracle of God. All a miracle of God. Where my life had been spared multiple times, where I could have literally been not been here, were it not for the grace of God. If he did it then, why won't he do it now? He did it for me, I know my life, and you observe and you look at your own life. And you see and you look back at those points in your life and you say, okay God, you did it then. God, I'm, I'm having a tough time with this now. But I'm trusting you now. Help me to believe, God. Help me to believe. Help me to believe. Right? Help me to believe. This is going to happen and it will be granted him. Do you hear that? It will be. It's not maybe, it will be. So what does it say? Don't doubt, but believe. Right? Don't doubt, but believe. If God said it, he's going to do it, and it's going to be in his time. Of course, it's in his timing and in his way, the way he's going to do it. Not our timing and not our way, but his timing and his way. Verse 24, therefore I say to you, all things which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. All things for which you ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. What is it that, is your heart centered on what God wants? Remember that his will, is your heart set on what his purpose is for your life? What his plans are for you? what he desires for you. He says he'll give us the desires of our heart. Our, as our desires are in tune with what he desires, right? And as we pray and we say, God, yeah, you know my heart. You know what's going on. You see these things. And God, you know this situation, these circumstances. Please help me. Please help me, God. Please help me. Please help me to believe. God, I, and, I, and I believe you. And you're going to do it. Even though it's impossible, seems impossible, even though it seems like this is, there's just no way this, that this could happen, 
God, I'm believing you and I'm trusting you for it to happen. I don't know how, God. I don't know how, but I'm believing you and I'm trusting you and you're going to do it. In your time and your way. It's going to be done. How? I don't know. But if we serve a God, he keeps his word, doesn't he? And God is able, our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we even ask or even think according to his power that works within us, right? It's true. Pray and ask and believe and you have received them and it will be granted, right? That's a good, that's a good plan, isn't that? It's a good way to do things. And then lastly, he, Jesus goes on, and whenever you stand praying, so he's talking about praying. So what's our first resort when, we, when we're when we in dilemma? We pray and we seek and we ask God. God, please, we seek him. Pray. But also, Jesus goes on not only to pray and ask and believe, but we need to also make sure that what our hearts are what clean, don't we? We need to make sure our hearts are clean before him as we ask. So when you stand praying, what? Forgive. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. Another version would be sin would be transgressions. Right? So we need to, we can't have malice in our hearts for people. We can't have hurt feelings in our hearts of people. If people have done things and said things maybe we didn't like that were hurtful, that were mean, that were, that were really cut us and we were really upset about it and we're really upset about with that person, then we need to come to a place where we let it go. Can you not forget, we, we're, we, it's not, that's not the point. The point is, is that you'll always rem you may rem remember that, but at least you can let it go and forgive. You can let it go and forgive. And sometimes that's the hardest thing. Sometimes that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing to do, is to forgive and let go. And, I, and I'm going to use an illustration because my kids love Marvel movies and they, my youngest son loves, especially loves Spider-Man. And one of the Spider-Man movies, it was, it was um, I forget which one it was, but it was, it was the first set of Spider-Man. And Spider-Man was facing Sandman. And Sandman was, he happened to be in a robbery and he, was, happened, to, he happened to be the one who had killed his Uncle Ben. And Sandman could never get over that in his own heart. But he didn't do it, he did it because he was desperate because his daughter was dying. But then Peter had come, had come, he was really angry and upset with him about that. And one of the things that he had to do was, Peter came to a place, Peter Parker came to a place where he says, I forgive you. And that brought relief to the Sandman of the burden that he had carried and the guilt that he had carried all those years. He had forgiven him for what he had done. I know that's a, a worldly example, but at least the world gets an idea, an understanding of what the power of forgiveness can, happen, can have in our lives. And that man went away forgiven. We have the power of life and death in our tongues. And we have the power to be able to forgive those who maybe have sinned against us and have hurt us and said mean things to us or done mean things or hurtful things to us. And we have to be able to forgive and we have to let it go. We have to let, because that's what makes us angry, right? That's what breaks up relationships. I can't forgive that person for what they've done. I can't do it. Well, if God forgave you, and all the nasty and wonder, bad things that you've done, why can't you forgive someone else? Well, I just can't do it. Well, yes, you can. But if God, God, you have the power within you to do it, right? 
You have, God's given you the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to forgive those he forgave you. Now it says here, if you don't forgive those who have forgiven you, how can your Father forgive you, right? Forgive, let go, reconcile, folks. Let it go. Let it go. Be at peace with your brother. Do you have to be best friends? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is at least be able to forgive and be able to move on so that it doesn't hold you. Because when we hold on to unforgiveness in our heart, there's a heavy ball and chain around our ankles. And it, it impedes us and hinders us from moving forward. But when, we're, when we forgive and we let go, it's free. And we're allowed to go away. And we're allowed to be free to be able to do that which God intended us to do. What God is saying here today is, is he wants us to observe and learn. Learn what God has shown us in the, in the moment, in the situation, knowing that that's something that can happen that God wants to do in the future. We observe, we ask him, saying, God, I don't understand what's going on here, but I'm trusting you. And then we see God, what God is doing, and we trust and we believe and we have faith in him that he's going to accomplish what he says he's going to do. And then we're able to, as well, be able to forgive and let go of those who maybe have hurt us in some way or form. Because when we do, that's when we have freedom to be the people that God called us to be. Pray and believe. Observe, pray and believe. Have faith in God and forgive. And watch what God can do in your life because then you'll be free to be able to do all that God wants you to do and the wonderful, miraculous things that God intends for you to do. Right?